Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on, the purpose of this whole program each week is to find our way back to a Christianity that truly resembles Jesus Christ. Because we're looking at how the church has strayed from that and become something unlike Jesus Christ all too often. So uh, we're looking right now in the, in the last couple of programs and in this program uh, at Acts chapter 6 as a really important transitional period in the life of the early church. So we're going to do that right now, right after our brother Mark. That's Mark, by the way. Hello. That's my sweet patootie Alice. Hi. And I'm me. I'm Alan. Butch. Whatever. Son of, of a child of God. Yes, put you in your way. All right. So Mark's going to ask God's blessing on our time together here. In John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Lord, I am grateful that you regard the truth. It's a firm foundation. It's a cornerstone that we need, Lord. And we're thankful that you are the truth, Lord. Please reveal that truth that we need to us right now in this Bible study. Amen. 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 Give us understanding, Lord. Yes. yes. So, as I was saying, we're looking at that transition, and one of the things that I, I, I'm trying to make evident is that what is often overlooked in Acts chapter 6 is that there is a movement, the, the, the body, the church of Christ, I was going to say the body of Christ, the body of Christ is supposed to be a body. The analogy is always a body. And a body is an organism. Yes, living. A living, breathing organism. Mm -hmm. Right? We are the body and he is the head. There's a transition, there's something happening here where it's going from being an organism to being an organization. Yes. And that's what I want to try and get a better grip on, that we see that, as I said, because we're trying to find our way back to being what we're supposed to be. So we're in Acts chapter 6, and we were, uh, in, our, in our last problem, it was not a problem, it was a program, it was a blessing. What are you talking <laughs> it's an about? an episode. Okay. Okay. We were talking about the apostles, we were talking about Greek philosophy, how, it, how it's affected or infected the church. So now the next thing that you're talking about would be the, how it became an enterprise, a business uh, in the West. Uh, yeah. Organization. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll say it again, that you know, it has been said that Christianity started as a fellowship in Jerusalem, became a philosophy in Greece, which is what we talked about, became a culture in Rome, uh -huh. became more organized, and became an enterprise in the West. All right? So we're looking at it becoming a culture, it's becoming more organizational, it's becoming more, more structural, which isn't always necessarily bad, no. as long as the command center, you know, it, the, it, the head is always correct. Right. So we're talking about, and please, if you've, if you've, let me say that if you've missed the previous programs, it would be worth your while to go back and take a look at the last, at least the last couple of programs, so this will make more sense to you, okay? Um, in Acts chapter 6, we were talking about that. Now, what happened is because of the vision in the body that was there, a, a problem arose, a complaint arose, and the apostles, and what I've been saying, and I think I've demonstrated it fairly well, is that they were dealing with the symptom of the problem rather than dealing with the problem itself. Mm -hmm. rather, than, rather than dealing with the division, which is what they're supposed to be doing is, you know, teaching and training the body of Christ, they start dealing with, with the, the symptom, which was the distribution of food, and the problem with that is that action actually begins to bring a tolerance to sin. Yes. It brings a tolerance to division that lasted, by the way, for, for quite some time. It lasted in Peter's own life mm -hmm. until Paul confronts him, and right? Repents. And it might have still been afterwards. Wow. 
You know, and, and one of the things, please let me make this perfectly clear. None of us, none of us here have reached yet a state of perfection. It says, you know, if, if any of us say that we have no sin, we're, we're sinning and, and doing that. We're a liar and we'll make God to be a liar. We all have failings and falling short. That's why we're supposed to be a body and working together, right? So if you, if you think that I'm saying something wrong in this study, and I've said over and over, test everything I say, but test it against God's Word, all right? Let me know. Go, go to our Facebook page, In Search of Christianity, and you know, let's communicate and talk about it. But the thing that's going on here is that there's a structure taking place, all right? Mm -hmm. The apostles, I'm saying, you know, that they didn't deal with the problem. They're dealing with the symptom of the problem. And they've come up with a solution then that doesn't deal with the problem. And that solution was that, that they were going to have the congregation pick seven men to dis take on the task of distributing the food. So we're at verse 4, in Acts chapter 6, verse 4. And the statement of the apostles here is, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So what they're saying is we can't deal with this problem because we've got to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Well, that, that sounds nice. And the word there, devote there, by the way, in the Greek, literally means to give ourselves continually mm. all right, mm. to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Which is something well, that sounds we need good. to be doing. But the time. fact of the matter is, I remind everybody that's listening to this, particularly the pastors, all right, that we're all, not, none of us are, are to be hearers of the word. We're all called to be doers of the word. We're all called to study, to show ourselves approved unto God and study the word. Mm -hmm. So the fact is, there's no part that's exempt to just set itself apart. This is what happened in the early church when monasteries and monks began to grow. You know, just go away and pray. Well, there may be a time when you go away and pray, mm -hmm. but it should be a brief time mm -hmm. just to refresh because we're supposed to be in the world but not of it. The Great Commission is that we're to go out into all of the world. We're going to go out and make disciples. We're not supposed to sit and meditate. No. We're supposed to do, right? Didn't Paul spend a time away studying the Word? That had a, that had a purpose. Well, yeah, but even for... then it talks about he was also proclaiming the Gospel. Mark is talking about when, when Paul, the Apostle Paul, first encountered Jesus and got saved, he spent three years in, basically in the wilderness outside. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it says he immediately began to proclaim the Word. Mm -hmm. So he's doing both. He's spending time, and this is, this is the model. Everybody has to spend time hearing from God, right. conversing with God, all right? That's called prayer, having conversations with God. But doing the Word at the same time, mm -hmm. okay? So... What's happening is the apostles are setting themselves aside and basically saying, in a sense, we're too important to be doing this menial work. Right. And that's the beginning of this organizational... That's where they went to you. That, ...that I find there's no justification for that in Scripture whatsoever, right? As you pointed out last time, last week, yeah. that Jesus gave Absolutely. us that's why example. I say you, you need to see the last couple right. because... Jesus is the model for all of us. That's right. And he found time to, you know, at no time was he not devoted to the Father's Word. That's right. And devoted to the action. Okay, he was continually giving himself to prayer and to the ministry that the Father had given him. But at the same time, he was serving. Yes. Okay? Serving shouldn't interrupt your calling by God. Right, right. right. Some of the great events in the New Testament happened by interruption, yeah. all right? Jesus Christ, on his way to see the, the, uh, the what was a centurion's servant or son, yeah. and he is inter interrupted by a woman who has a hemorrhage for 12 years. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, well, I don't have time to do this. No, he didn't. He did it. Yeah. And that's one of the great miracles in the Bible, is when she touched him, that power flowed out of him, all right? Yeah. Paul. You know, he's in his ministry. He winds up with, with Silas in jail in Philippi. Is that an interruption? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Because that, that story is really not about Paul. That story is about, about the jailer. About the jailer. Mm -hmm. Paul is on his way to Rome. And he gets interrupted by a storm. And winds up shipwrecked on the shores of, of Malta. Was that 
but oh, keep, keep what, was that an interruption no it wasn't an interruption that's what brought the word of god and the power of god to that island lazarus too oh well, it's all over it's, i mean that was out. an interruption that he kept going for oh, two for two right, yeah. for two more days but the, the point is we are all called to ministry mm -hmm. and i promise you that i made that clear in earlier in yes. earlier programs yes. every christian and it's clear from the scriptures Look at Paul's letter to the, to the Corinthians where he talks about the Spirit of God works through each one individually as he wills. We are all called to serve and to minister. Not all the same way by any means. Yeah. And there is a distinct five-fold ministry. Mm -hmm. You know, the, evan the, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So there, there is that. And we're to give honor to whom honor is due. But that doesn't give anybody freedom from serving. There's structure. All ministry is about serving. And that's certainly one of the early programs we did. Mm -hmm. All right. So here I see a problem taking place. All right. All right. As I just mentioned, Jesus, surely and demonstrably devoted to prayer and the word, managed to accomplish that while doing all that he did. Mm -hmm. And clearly all Christians are expected to follow an invitation to him in both pursuits, regardless of their daily occupations. You know, Paul wrote in Colossians and says to all of us, he says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping an alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. You have to be devoted to prayer. I have to be devoted to prayer. To the Thessalonians, Paul said, pray without ceasing. That's right. Okay? So if you're serving tables, you better be praying at the same time. Yeah, yeah. You better be doing all things as unto the Lord. To the Romans, Paul wrote, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Romans 12, 10 through 12, right? And Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you abide, continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. If you're a plumber, you better be praying while you plumb. If you're a carpenter, you better be talking to God while you're hammering. If you're a gardener. If you're a gardener. Okay, I mean, whatever you are doing in this life, it is the ministry that God has given you. And you better not do it without Him. Okay? So this, this what's happening, when the apostles say, okay, we'll go pray and get the word from God and come back to you. This has led to a spiritual fast food generation mm. that becomes dependent on pastors and teachers, we want them to spend great. Listen, I listen. I'm, I've been teaching the, this word for almost 40 years. I know what I'm talking about. We're expecting the teachers to go out and spend. Oh, I, I spend a lot of time praying about these things. Okay, but then they're going to come back and sit here for half an hour and just throw everything out on you, so you don't have to study. Not at all. Now, you know, I think I ended last week by saying, and this is important. When, when you leave this program, do not stop with the content of this program. We had a dear brother, Arthur Burton, who just went to be with the Lord at 102 years old over in North Wales. We, we spent a lot of time with Arthur. And Arthur, one of the things he always said was, we, we do these great meetings over there. He said, the meeting doesn't start until the meeting ends. Right. <laughs> now, I can't do anything more than plant that little seed in you. But God gave me a revelation of what that was one night when I was staying at Arthur's house, house after a meeting. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, it was like I felt a tap on my shoulder. And God said to me, this is after having meetings all day that day. Mm -hmm. The Lord said to me, it's time for us to meet. Mm -hmm. And God gave me understanding of what he had revealed right. in those meetings all day. Okay? Don't, don't just come for half an hour and then walk away and, and brush it off, all right? Otherwise, you, you, you're, not, you're wasting time being here. What I'm trying to do is get us, you and us, to discuss with the Lord what I said in the very beginning of this. How do we get to that place where we return? That's what revival is. I mean, where we get back to that place where the bond servants of Jesus Christ look like Jesus Christ, live like Jesus Christ, act like Jesus Christ, and bear that witness to the world, this dark and dying world.
okay? So anyhow, so now the apostles have said they're going to devote themselves here to, to, to prayer and the word. And they've said, well, to the congregation, we want you to pick seven men filled with wisdom and the Holy Spirit to take care of the distribution of the food, the serving, right? And in verse 5, it goes on to say, the statement found approval with the whole congregation. That should be a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't doubt that, okay? It's a little scary when everybody agrees, okay? And, and we should, because we should be of one mind, yes. all right? But more often than not, well, let me just go on, all right? <laughs> So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. So now I'm blessed by the unity that I see in this, that's being displayed in the congregation now. But one of the reasons we might have unity going on here is because it takes the responsibility off their shoulders and puts it on these seven guys, right? It's easy to agree on somebody else doing the work. Yes. <laughs> I just, I'll just throw this in as we go past here. If there was a problem with the distribution of food, you know who should have been taking care of it? The congregation. Yes, it says if you see your brother in need, and you should be seeing your brother, okay, then just take care of the problem. Right. We, don't need to, we don't need to start hiring people. We don't need to do this and do that. If you see a need, take care of it. How simple is that? Okay. So, the seven that they picked, it says in verse 6, These they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid hands on them. So I thought this would be a really good time to talk about one of the problems that exists in the church today, and that is our concept of ordination. Okay? Ordination is when we recognize the gift that God has put in somebody, right. the ministry that somebody has been called to, when we recognize that, mm -hmm. and hear like they laid their hands on them, which was a common practice, mm -hmm. practice back in the early church. It didn't have to be this ordination ceremony. It was like, you know, they laid hands on them and prayed, prayed to encourage them, prayed to bless them, prayed to strengthen them, but they're not empowering them. Man doesn't have the power to give that power to another. Right. It requires the calling of God in that person's life. Absolutely. And it takes the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's, it's funny because Alice and I got in a discussion today that came up from something we were looking at and studying together about ministerial licenses. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, you know, you have to have a light. Listen, I've traveled over five continents, and I can't tell you how many times I've gone someplace for the first time, and somebody in a congregation will say, Oh, do you have a license? Mm. And I pull out my wallet and I say, Yeah, I've been driving for 50 some odd years now. And they say, Oh, no, 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 how? I gotta, no, I don't have a license to preach. I have a command to Absolutely. preach. I don't, have a, I don't have a license to teach the Word of God. I have a command to preach the Word of God. I don't have a license to serve the body of Christ. I have an obligation by the love that's been poured into my heart to serve the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's not about having a license. One of the problems with a license, and you know, Alice will attest to this, and I think Mark, you may have seen it sometimes. A number of times in my ministerial life, my life in, in the body, I have been challenged both by uh, secular and religious organizations telling me that they required that I get a permit or get a permission or get a, uh, a license to do a certain activity. And I have always refused to do that. And it's not that I am trying to be obstinate and I believe in being submissive to governing authorities. Well, the activity is preaching. Preaching. Yes. Absolutely. Preaching. I mean, I used to do a lot of preaching on the street. My ministry started back in the mid-70s preaching on the streets of New York City where I grew up. The deal is, if you, it's like with my driver's license. If I take a license, which is permission to drive a car, I have to recognize that they now have the authority to take that permission away from me. That's right. And they do. If they don't like how I drive, they can take that permission away from me. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I say I accept the fact that I need your permission to preach the gospel, I am recognizing their ability to, to command me not to, to preach the gospel. That. Yeah. You know? 
and God called me. He's the only one. He's the only one that did that, and he's the only one that can. He won't take that away because the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, irrepentable. So that's not a concern. How would that have worked for? I mean, if if you needed the permission of either man or government to preach the gospel, how would that have worked out for Jeremiah, for example? Jeremiah opposed the king. Oh, okay. How would that have worked out for Isaiah? Or Peter? Or Paul? Or for that matter, Jesus Christ? You have to remember, you know, it says the world hated him. Don't be surprised that it hates us. The world, you may have times of peace with the world, but don't think that the enemy is not still after. They want to, they, the enemy wants to stop the word from going forth. He wants the love of God to be blocked and prohibited, right? And so, you have to be willing to suffer the con consequences. One, yes, absolutely. One of the yes. deals is, you know, years ago, I started, when the internet first came to public light back in the mid-90s, mm -hmm. uh, I started a company. I was part of starting a, a pretty large Christian internet company. And one of the things that we provided was that churches could use our internet site to look for people in ministry mm -hmm. to come and work for them. So I saw this, and one of the things I saw, and I, I see today because I just glance at it, see what's happening, is that you know if you're gonna if you're gonna be a senior pastor, but you have to have a PhD, you have to have a Doctor of Divinity, you have to have this. Where would that leave Jesus? Remember what it says in John seven fourteen to seventeen. But it was when it was now in the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying. How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. You know what? You ask God. If, if you think, you know, if you have questions, ask God. Because the fact of the matter is, my teaching is not my own. And if it, any time that it is, if it happens, please somebody call me to repentance because I am not allowed to speak anything on my own. Either are you. Now, going back to the license, one of the things that you should make clear is the fact that you weren't disobeying authority because they didn't have the authority, the authority to, do that. to do that. Because we're not supposed to right. disobey governing authority. Absolutely, we're not. But the governing authority like, doesn't have the authority it, right. to tell so you Right, like when Peter preach. and the apostles were yes. commanded by the Sanhedrin, uh, you know, um, not to preach the name of Jesus. That's and right. They said, you be the judge whether we have to be obedient to God or be obedient right. to you. Now, do I, do I believe in education? Yes. Well, Paul says, study to show yourself approved. I, I studied theology in a mainline seminary. I did graduate level study that God protected me from and that I didn't finish because I chose to walk away from it at, at some point, right? But I walked away and I still today, if I had it on my business card, which I don't, by the way, I could have, my name is Alan W. McDaniel Jr. B.A. M.A. D.D. That's right. That sound impressive? <laughs> it stands for born again, made anew, and divinely designed. So go ahead. We can all put those letters. Well, because that's what's important. The only thing that's important is that you are filled with the Spirit of God, right. walking in the Spirit of God, filled with the Word of God, and doing the ministry that He has called you to. You can't call yourself, listen, that's why I said, you know, nobody else can empower you. Your denomination can't call you to it. God's got to call you to it. Mm -hmm. Your church can't call you to it. Mm -hmm. God's got to call you to it. But you want to say, you can't call yourself to it either. No. God's got to call you to That's it. Right. I, one of the things that concerns me in the church today is Facebook and things like that. Mm. The social media. Everybody that has Facebook now thinks that they're a teacher. That's it scary. says that not many of you become teachers, for by this you incur a stricter judgment. That's right. So be prayerful about that. The prophets, the evangelists, the, the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. They can be used of God to equip you for the work of service. Yeah. That's the purpose. Mm -hmm. But only the Lord can call you. And only the Holy Spirit can empower you in your ministry. Okay? Okay. okay. Everybody said okay. Amen, okay. brother. Mm -hmm. 
So the word of God, it says in verse 7, kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Well, I, I want to talk about evangelism, God's plan for evangelism, not generally what is the church's plan for evangelism. And yes, I believe there is a difference, and I believe that once I do this teaching, you will see clearly what the difference is, all right? All right, so in verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. What? What? Wait a minute. He was chosen by the congregation to serve, to serve tables. tables. But apparently, this man, full of faith in the Holy Spirit, with a heart willing to serve, was chosen by God to serve the bread of life and the words of eternal life confirmed by power. And based on the, his words in the, in the next chapter of Acts, in Acts chapter 7, right? Mm. He must have found time in the midst of serving to know the word pretty well because he delivers the single most complete history of God's work in his people in all of the New Testament. Read it. Start yeah. Acts chapter 7 and start reading it. Even the Old Testament too. Uh, well, Okay, in, in, well, yeah, he's, he's kind of recounting everything in the Old Testament. Yeah. But it's amazing. So somehow he was able to serve. He was called to serve tables by the congregation. God called him to a different ministry. Why? Because of, I'm going to say because of his willingness to serve. Okay? Because the next time you see him, here he is. He's out full of grace and power, performing great wonders and signs among the people, and preaching the word of God. It says in 9, but some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Syrians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia, Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. Right? But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They stirred the people up, the elders and the scribes, they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forward false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place and alter the customs which <coughs> Moses handed down to us. <coughs> Fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Okay, I, I can't get into this now. We're running out of time, but I, I do want to say this. When you get attacked, and if you're serving God, if you are fulfilling your ministry, I doubt very seriously you'll go through that without ever getting attacked by the devil. Sure. All right? And, but it takes lies. The devil's a liar, a, a, the, by a liar by nature and the father of lies. So if, if somebody <coughs> says something against you, attacks you, you need to look at it and say, if this is a lie, forget about it. And it's not your job to deal with it. It's God's deal, job to deal with it. Yeah. And no weapon formed against you shall prosper. If you examine what's being said against you, and it is true, all you got to do is repent. But one way or the other, deal with it. All right? Oh, gosh. I keep saying this every week. <coughs> time comes and the time goes so quickly. I, do, if you, can we do this for eight hours? Okay, I can. But we don't have eight hours, so... Father, I just ask your blessing upon everybody that's here participating in this, everybody who hears this word, including us, Lord, that you would use this time to draw us closer and closer to you and that we would be more and more, Father, like your Son, Christ Jesus. Help us to praise him and show in our lives that he is Lord to your glory, Father. Hallelujah and amen. amen. Well. Until next time, may the Lord God bless you and use you for the glory of his name. Till then, bye-bye. far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sin.